This is Radio TV Phono Nut, and some months ago you might remember me doing a resurrection video on a cardboard cased Emerson Tube radio from about 1941 that had definitely seen better days. It was one that apparently someone in the military had purchased at a, at a military base. Well, I recently found this Emerson cardboard radio here, and even though it's not in the greatest of shape, it's in a lot better shape than uh than the last one we had our hands on. In fact, I think this one can actually be serviced and made to look nice. Uh, this is in a cardboard case with an arched top, and you can see there are some blemishes on the cabinet. I think a brown magic marker would help mask some of those, and there's some points where it's coming loose here, and we need to glue it back together couple of the speaker slats, grill slats, you can see have been pushed in. They're not completely broken, so maybe I can push those back from the inside of the cabinet and uh, reinforce them. Uh, somebody has replaced the power cord on this set, but uh, I believe that's all they've done. I peeked in this when I first got it, and I really don't see any evidence of any repairs, at least not any recent repairs anyway. But miraculously, the radio does play. Maybe not as great as it could, but it does play, and we'll let it warm up and see what happens. Well, it's picking up our weak country station, so that's impressive. Dealing with one of the most... Talk station about 90 miles away. That's what we're losing it. And we're losing it. I know. Well, we can't let it. We're not going to lose. We're not going to lose it. But God bless you. I, I got. Okay, this thing does pretty good for having not been serviced. Right, let's get it apart and see what we got under the hood. Oh yes, and we were connected to my outside antenna for that little test, so I feel like when we're done, those, those weak stations will come in even stronger. Here's the cabinet bottom. As you can see, it's kind of warped and coming loose, but we can glue that back down and kind of patch this up a little bit and it'll look presentable. Here's the top of the chassis. It just looks like it needs a good cleaning. So we have a 12SA7, 12K7, 12SQ7, 50L6, and 35Z5. A pretty standard lineup for the era. And it looks like we have an electrodynamic speaker here. Here's the underside of the chassis. As you can see, it looks pretty much, as far as I can say, tell, all original except for the power cord replacement. So yeah, it's amazing that this radio plays as well as it does, but we're going to get it to play better, and then we're going to check our parts along the way. And here's our capacitor breakdown. This is our across-the-line capacitor for the AC for noise suppression purposes, and if it shorts, given the way it's wired in the circuit, it will blow the 35Z5 rectifier tube filament, so that one's going to get replaced right now because I'm kind of running low on 35Z5s and I don't need to blow any out unnecessarily. This capacitor here connects between the plate and the cathode of the audio output tube. It's our plate bypass capacitor that, well, it helps shape the tonal qualities and it also helps helps prevent possible arcing inside the tube and keeps any RF off of the uh, plate of the audio output tube. This cap here is our plate from the 12SQ7 first audio tube to grid of the audio output tube coupling capacitor. Its purpose is to keep the DC voltage, it's on the plate of the first audio tube, off of the control grid of the uh, audio output tube. And this cap is almost always leaky because if DC gets to the uh, control grid of the audio output tube that will 
upset the bias and cause the tube to conduct harder, which in turn will draw more current through the audio output transformer, which could in turn damage both the transformer and the uh, tube. This capacitor here couples our volume control to the control grid of the 12SQ7 first audio tube, and its purpose is to keep any possible DC off of the grid of the first audio tube and to isolate this volume control from that tube. And then we have this big capacitor here, which is our AVC filter capacitor. It connects between the AVC line and ground. It keeps any RF off of the AVC line. And if that capacitor opens, you're going to have all kind of squealing and oscillation going on that you don't want. And if it becomes leaky or shorted, it's just going to load down the AVC line and cause the AVC circuit not to work correctly. And then on the back of the antenna here, we have an isolation capacitor for the external antenna connection that that isolates the external antenna input from the from the chassis here, so you don't get the crap knocked out of you by the external antenna lead, or possibly or possibly have smoke and sparks fly. All right, this capacitor here is our electrolytic filter capacitor probably should be just a 50 microfarad and a 30 microfarad. So let's first, before we dive into this for testing, let's just go ahead and get rid of this across the line capacitor and so we don't have it short and blow shrapnel all over the place and blow out my rectifier tube. Okay, new across the line capacitor, old capacitor connected to the capacitor tester. Is it leaky? Let's see. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That one is on the verge of uh, was on the verge of just blowing its end out. All right, looking at the cathode voltage at our rectifier tube with the set warmed up, it's running about 115 or so volts, which is not too terribly bad. I'm just really surprised there's no noticeable filter hum, so I will remove that filter capacitor and see how it tests. And looking at the control grid voltage on our audio output tube, it's trying to swing positive, so that tells me that that coupling capacitor is leaky. So yeah, we might as well just go on ahead and change all of these right now. And of course, I will test them when we uh, take them out, just to show you that they are indeed leaky. And it always amazes me that these radios even with parts that are 10,000 percent out of tolerance will often still play to some degree of normalcy. Okay, audio output tube plate bypass capacitor. Leaky is all get out as you can see. And before we change it I'll go ahead and check this 500k ohm uh, uh, grid bias resistor here. I'm sure it's gone way up in value. If it's bad it'll be easier to change without that other capacitor in the way. Yeah, this resistor's bad. It's reading 1.4 meg. It's supposed to be 500K, and in order for me to test it accurately, I had to clip out this uh, coupling capacitor because it's so leaky that it was acting more like a resistor than a capacitor and uh, throwing off my reading. Okay, we got all the capacitors replaced and a few resistors that were way out of tolerance, and then this happened chassis started sliding off the bench and in, a, in haste to grab the uh, chassis I ended up poking my finger through the uh, speaker cone and it never fails. You get a speaker that's made it 80 years in good shape and then I end up poking my finger through it so now we're going to have to take the wood glue and patch this up. It should still work okay but still don't make me happy. Okay, while we're waiting on the glue to dry, uh, we'll analyze this electrolytic capacitor. It's the only one that was still functioning somewhat like it should in the set. All of the paper capacitors were leaky off the charts. This is a dual 20 microfarad capacitor, and I think it is a replacement, but it looks like a very old replacement, probably no newer than the uh, early 1950s. 
Now on the modern day little digital capacitance meter, both sections read a little over about 22 microfarad. One section read 22 and the other 24, which is not bad. So let's connect it to the old school tester and test it for leakage. All right, section one, we're reading about the same value-wise on this old school meter. Let's crank up the power factor knob, and yeah, you can see the eye opening. And yeah, maximum eye opening, we have a power factor of about, oh, 23%, which is kind of high. All right, let's check it, check it for leakage on the 20 volt scale. That's okay, that's good. Okay, leakage. First section passes the leakage test. All right, second section is about the same for value, capacitance value, and power factor. And it's about the same for leakage, too. All right, here we are, first section on the ESR meter, and it's reading very high. Oh, about 12 or 13 ohms. Second section reads about 5 ohms, which is also high. That explains the uh, high power factor measurement that we were seeing on the old school tester. Now let me show you what the ESR of a good, fresh, 20 microfarad capacitor. Here's a brand new one, a little less than 2 ohms. Let's try another one. Here's another one. It's reading about 1 ohm. So, yeah, that's how a new one should read. Now, this DMM you see here is one that belongs to a friend. It's a talking digital multimeter, and he was having some issues with it. And my yellow meter has finally died completely, so I was using this one to more or less analyze his meter and kind of use it in my work here at the same time and and I can't get his meter to talk and it, it doesn't appear to be very accurate at least on not on the high ohmage resistors up in the mega ohm range so I'm going to have to look into it but there's generally not a lot you can do with these you know you can clean the controls and check for bad solder connections and of course replace weak batteries but you know usually when these fail they're you know it's usually just better to replace them because there's so much surface mounted stuff inside that it's really not practical to try to repair one in fact that yellow meter that I'm fixing to replace I paid no more than 50 bucks for that meter years ago so I've gotten my money's worth out of it and it's probably going to be replaced by another 40 or 50 dollar meter that will actually probably have more functions on it than the yellow one did all those years ago. Okay, I've got the speaker cone glued from both sides and we'll let that sit overnight and then by the time I get ready to work on it again tomorrow that should be plenty dried up and then we can continue. Now, one other thing I'm going to have to do is rewire the IF transformers because the leads going up into them are rubber insulated and that insulation has turned to powder. So unfortunately, we're going to have to remove the IF transformers, take them apart and rewire them. The, most of the other wiring appears to be in pretty good shape. In fact, some of it is cloth covered. But that old rubber stuff going up into the IF transformers has seen better days and it's going to have to be replaced because it's just a matter of time before it crumbles even further and it touches something that it's not supposed to touch and causes us problems that we don't need. Okay, it's a new day and the glue is dried on the speaker and we'll now turn the radio on and do a progress check and make sure we haven't had any setbacks and if we haven't then we'll address the rubber wiring that needs to be replaced. Alright, that sounds good. Now it's 
try to get that blinding bulb out of your face. The reality is... Oh, Waylon. Yeah, that song brings back a memory. Back back in the summer of 84, we were visiting some relatives in Georgia. I think I was seven. We stopped in a gas station that still sold eight-track tapes, and Dad said, pick you out one, and I'll buy it. And I don't know what possessed me to pick out a Waylon Jennings tape, because I'd really never, I didn't really know anything about him at that age, but that's the one I picked out, and he bought it. And that particular song that was playing was the very first song on the tape, and Daddy hated it. He said it sounded too too much like hippie music. But after listening to the tape, I discovered that I made a good choice, but that tape was playing in the car while Dad was with us. If that song came on, he'd uh, reach over and hit the track change button on the tape player and I played that tape until it wore out and then later ye in later years I found a used copy of that album on vinyl which I still have and then I obtained another copy on the, of the album on 8 track just for sentimental reasons yeah, as you can see this green wire you can see the insulation just crumbling off of it so we're going to have to unsolder these wires from their respective tube socket pins and then compress these clips that hold the IF can in place, lift it out of the chassis, take it apart, rewire it with the uh, correct color wires just to make it easier for a technician to identify which is which, put it back in here and solder it up. Now, they're using solid core wire here and when I ordered all of my hookup wire, I ordered most of the popular colors in both solid and stranded varieties. Now, the reason you mainly want to use solid wire for under chassis use is because they may want the wire to stay in a certain position and solid wire is better about staying in its position than the more flexible stranded wire is. And also, wiring under the chassis is usually not subjected to vibration which could break the wire more easily. Now something like a loop antenna or a tube grid cap lead you should use stranded wire for that because those are things that will probably probably be probably be moved by humans say taking the loop antenna off to get to the tubes and the radio and you know pulling the grid cap off of the tube to replace the tube and for that application, you need something that's a little more, a little more flexible that won't break after it's bent a number of times. So, pretty much, good rule of thumb is if they use solid wire from the factory, use solid wire to replace it. If they use stranded wire, then go with stranded wire as your replacement. But before I start on this, I have to go up and watch for the FedEx truck. Uh, yeah. Tuesday of this week, a couple of things were sent to me via the post office, three-day priority mail. They were supposed to be here yesterday, Friday, and even their useless informed delivery digest told me that they were out for delivery, but when I actually did a manual check on the tracking number, guess what? The packages are several states away. I get up this morning and check the tracking numbers, and the same story. They're nowhere near my state. Meanwhile, a couple of FedEx packages that were sent to me Thursday, I believe, uh, they're on the vehicle for delivery today. So, what's up with the post office? Well, I think we know what's up with them. It's a government-ran agency, and you know how that goes. Uh, if you complain to them about it, they just give you the whole standard uh, COVID-19 and holiday excuses, but I don't want to hear none of that. They know all year that Christmas comes this time of year and they need to take steps to prepare for it as in hire some more help but they're not going to do that because that would be that would mean more paychecks coming out so 
And I don't want to hear about the COVID-19 excuses either. I, yes, I'm well aware that COVID-19 has severely impacted the country in a negative way, but it seems like the other carriers are still getting packages delivered in a reasonable amount of time. As far as FedEx goes, I I think I've had a couple of packages that were one day late, which, you know, you can kind of live with that, but when you ship something priority through the post office and pay extra for priority shipping, it's generally because the recipient wants the item in a hurry, or you want to get the item to the recipient in a hurry, and if you wanted to wanted it to take the slow boat from China scenic route, you could uh, save yourself some money and pay for the partial post shipping. You know, if they gone you know, bottom line is if they're not gonna be able to de- deliver on a service then they shouldn't offer it. But basically all priority mail is is, you know, we'll take more of your money but we're still not gonna get in any big hurry about getting it to you. Okay, looking at our IF transformer wires, this is for the second IF. We have green, black, blue, red. Green connects to one of the diode plates of the 12SQ7. Uh, Black is our AVC return. Blue connects to the plate of the 12SK7 IF amplifier. And red connects to the screen grid of the uh, same tube. So we'll just unsolder those wires, squeeze those clips, pull the IF transformer out, and it'll be out of the set. Okay, second IF transformer is removed. I made a scratch on the can here to show me which side goes towards the tuning condenser when I reassemble it. Now we need to carefully take a pair of pliers and work this clip out, and then once we do that, the innards should slide out of the can. Well, I don't know what's going on here, but I've removed the retainer clip, and this thing will not come out. I've tried tapping it from the top here, from tapping on these alignment pins here, and it's not coming loose, so I don't know what's holding it. I'd hate to have to do this the sloppy way by running heat shrink tubing down over the bare wire, but if it keeps on, then that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to risk destroying this just to get it out of the can. Okay, it looks like these were the trouble. In addition to the clip on the bottom, you've got these little tabs on each side of the can that have to be pried up. And then now I should be able to slide the assembly out of there. Okay, we finally have it out, and our green and black wires face the side of the can with the uh, scratch on it. And this is our insulating paper here to keep any of the terminals from touching the metal can and shorting out. Here's our solid green wire cut just a smidgen longer than the original to allow room for error. And we'll carefully unsolder it from this terminal, taking particular particular care not to break the little fine wire that goes to these coals. And then we'll solder the new green wire onto this terminal. And then we'll repeat the procedure for the remaining three wires. Okay, the black and green wires have been placed. Now would be a good time to check the continuity of that winding and make sure it's still still as it should be and we didn't accidentally break a connection somewhere. Okay, 20 ohms. That's excellent. So that winding hasn't been compromised. Now we'll do the same thing with the red and blue wires. Okay, the red and blue have now been soldered in place and continuity checked and that winding is also okay. So it's now time to wrap the insulating paper around the innards of this transformer and slide it all back in the can. Okay, here we are back together. It took a little finagling, but I got it to go back up in there. And I wrapped a layer of masking tape around that insulating paper because it was starting to get flaky and brittle too, so just to give it a little extra protection. All right, one more time before we put it back in the radio, we're going to test the continuity of the windings and make sure they're good, and then we'll just slip this back in the chassis and connect it up. All right, the two packages just showed up. Let's open the boxes and see what we have. I detect the presence of packing peanuts and saran wrap. This is supposed to be a radio chassis. What we have here is an RCA Institute's AM... AM6 tube radio from the 1950s. This was the radio that you built if you took their 
correspondence course on radio and TV repair. Uh, it's in pretty good shape. The speaker has seen better days and is either going to have to be fixed or replaced. Usually these didn't have a cabinet. It was just an open frame chassis. There's the underside. It looks like somebody added you know, probably either an external speaker jack or an audio input for a phonograph or whatever. All right, it looks like an external speaker connector. Here's the other one. You mean they actually used some bubble wrap? They didn't actually just throw it in a box and send it? And this one here is a Crosley from about 38 or 39, not to be confused with the current Chinese garbage. This is a real Crosley. Covers the standard broadcast in the shortwave band from, let's see, what, uh, 6 to 15. They made a, to a tombstone style radio in this same style cabinet that I have, but this is one that's kind of an oddball here. And the cabinet's in decent shape, except for some scratches and whatnot that can be rectified and chassis looks to be in good shape not all rusty just a good cleaning will do it a world of good but yeah that's pretty good buy it on Thursday get it on Saturday that shows a seller that's on top of things and a delivery carrier that's on top of things unlike the post office had they shipped it via the post office, I'd have been at least this time next week getting it. All right, IF transformer number two is done and soldered and back in place. Now it's time to do number one, which will be basically the same as number two for the exception of this one. Not only do they have it clipped to the chassis here, they also have the can soldered there to the chassis to ensure a good ground connection. And on this one, the grid cap wire for the 12SK7 comes out the top here. And you can see where the insulation is compromised. And it's touching the metal can here. That's a common problem. Somebody has already fixed this. So what we're going to have to do is cut the grid cap off and then unsolder this and unclip it and then pull it out just like we did the other one. It's going to be kind of a tedious procedure, but we've got to do it. Okay, after much finagling, we got the uh, IF transformer out of the chassis. And here's a better look at the out-of-focus grid wire. Here's a sharper view of the uh, grid cap wire. You notice the compromised insulation there. That bare wire was dangerously close to touching this can. That wouldn't have resulted in any, any smoke in this case, but it would have killed the radio. Okay, here's the coil assembly removed from the uh, can, and we'll rewire this one just like we did the other one, except we'll run our grid cap wire through the top of the transformer, and we'll use stranded wire for that particular lead. The rest of these, the other three, will be solid core wire. All right, here we are back together. I'll trim the grid cap lead as necessary. I did, however, run a piece of heat shrink tubing over it where it enters into the IF transformer just to give it a little added protection. Check the continuity. Everything's good. There's no shorts to the outer can, so we're ready to install this back in the chassis. Okay, we now have the grid cap, grid cap attached to the lead, crimped in place, and then soldered, and ready to place over here on the tube cap. Get on there. Okay, there it is. And that concludes the service of the IF transformers. And it's now time for me to take a little break from this. Okay, it was real nice of somebody to uh, install a polarized line cord on this set because I'm running low on them. In fact, when I went to Walmart the other day, I looked for some cheap extension cords. That's usually what I get for power cords, but they were pretty much sold out. There was nothing but empty boxes where the extension cords used to be and I wasn't going to buy the seven or eight dollar cords just to use as a replacement power cords. So yeah, it's a good thing we have this nice polarized cord on this radio. But anyway, when this radio was new it would have had a non-polarized power cord meaning that it could be plugged into the AC outlet either way. 
and usually the instructions that came with these radios stated that if the uh, radio had excessive hum that you were to uh, try reversing the power plug in the wall outlet before condemning the radio. Well, back then it was common, pro common practice to switch the neutral side of the AC power line, and the reason they did that was to prevent possible hum pickup, because if they had the switch in the hot side of the line, it's possible that AC the hot side of the line being so close to this volume control could induce hum, but personally I've never had that problem, not once, in all the radios I've messed with over the past 30-something years, but, you know, I guess anything's possible. I was looking at this power cord, and they have it all wired wrong. They have the hot side narrow blade connected to the switch, and then they have the wide blade neutral side connected over here to the rectifier tube. Now, assuming this is plugged into an outlet that's wired correctly, this chassis is going to be hot when the radio is turned on. Now, had they had this wired with the neutral side wide blade to the switch and the hot side over here to the rectifier, and assuming it was plugged into a correctly wired outlet, the chassis would not be hot as long as the power switch was turned on. However, once the power switch is turned off and the radio is left plugged in, your chassis will then become hot because the hot side of the line will be connected to the series string tube filament line and the final tube in that line, the 12SQ7, the end of it will be connected to chassis here and what they taught us in electronics is you have maximum voltage across an open circuit so that makes the chassis hot when the set is off. Now the way we can get around that is to move the power switch to the hot side of the line and assuming you have the radio plugged into an outlet that's wired correctly the chassis will not be hot even if the set is turned on or off, it won't make any difference. It'll still be, it still won't be a hot chassis. So we're going to rewire this and put our switch in the hot side of the power line instead of the neutral side and wire this power cord in correctly. And where well, they mounted it to the chassis, yeah, they tied a knot, which is okay, but they didn't put any kind of grommet here. And as we saw on the IF transformer lead that had all of its insulation rubbed off, the same thing can happen here to power cords if it rubs too much on the chassis. So we want to correct that as well. Okay, there we go. Safety grommet in place. Hot side, narrow blade, wire to the switch. Switch going over here to the rectifier. And the neutral side, wide blade, go straight over here to the chassis which in this case chassis is circuit ground Four one. I'm Ty Holden's Radio 1200 WOAI this report is sponsored All right, by here we are. .org. and I'm not hearing any objectionable hum food on the table you can help change their future in a single moment see how Unbound.org. The ultimate Christmas tradition is heading holidays. Don't miss it. station out of Monroe, Louisiana. All 
Alright, there's a couple of other loose ends we need to tie up before we proceed to the alignment. Uh, the rubber grommets that help hold the tuning condenser assembly to the chassis, as you can tell, have turned to powder, and we need to find something to replace those. And then we need to try to clean this chassis up a little bit. And then once that's done, we can proceed to the alignment, and then this radio will be fixed. Okay, I found this rubber plug that I think I can make work, but I'm going to have to I'm going to have to punch the center out of it to allow the uh, allow the screw the screw to go through it. Okay, uh, it would be easier for me to change these grommets just by removing the whole tuning assembly, and that's what I've done here. It's really not that difficult, and with this tuner out of the way. It'll make me make it easier for me to more thoroughly clean this chassis. I don't know where this radio was stored to get all this black crap on it. As filthy as the chassis is, I'm surprised the uh, cabinet made it as good as it did through all of this. And you see just that little area I clean with contact cleaner and a Q-tip. So that will give you an idea about how filthy this is. It's even all over the speaker and the audio output transformer and everywhere else. And this tuning condenser is really cruddy, so in order for me to really clean it, I need it out of there anyway. So that's fine. Okay, we now have the chassis and speaker relatively clean. Had to take some stuff off in order to get to everything. It's not perfect, but it's a lot better than it was. I did not try to clean the speaker frame itself too much because I was afraid I'd slip and end up puncturing the cone again. Managed to take those rubber plugs and punch holes in them and turn them into grommets for the tuning condenser and now it sits stable and doesn't wobble so all we have to do now is go connect all of the wires and reinsert the 12SA7 tube and hopefully this thing will play. Okay, we're back together and playing, but here's an example of why we always wait until the very last to do an alignment. Me taking this tuner out, cleaning it up, and possibly moving some wires around under the chassis as I was taking everything apart and putting it back together, threw our oscillator out of alignment enough so where 1010 is now coming in up at about 1100, where it was coming in closer to 1010 before. At 76, he is at higher risk for a serious. But that's no problem. That's what these trimmer capacitors that are piggybacked onto the tuning condenser are for. Arizona, his son Andrew, who works in the White House, tested positive. <laughs> Big trail right now, three nothing at home to Philadelphia. You all the Giants and Seahawks are going at it from the Okay, so we'll home line this right thing now, and that ought to take that care contest. of it. Rams just punched. Okay, we're now connected to the signal generator. Signal generator connected to the grid cap of the. Uh, wait a minute. Yeah, what am I supposed? What am I doing? I'm on the wrong tube here. Hang on. What am I? Okay, I had my signal generator going into the grid cap of the IF amplifier tube. Now, I could have done it that way and peeked out the second IF transformer and then moved my grid, my signal generator lead back to the grid of the uh, oscillator and mixer tube and peeked out the first transformer, but generally the only time you really need to do it that way is if it's really out of whack, as in somebody took a screwdriver and tightened everything down. So, radio plugged into an isolation transformer, signal generator ground connected to chassis, signal generator hot lead connected to the grid of the 12SA7 through a .01 microfarad capacitor, volume on the radio cranked wide open, signal generator up just high enough to give me enough output to get a usable indication. If your output, your signal generator output is too high, then that will cause the AVC circuit to kick in, and that can give you false readings. So, and I also checked using my DC voltmeter, checked the heads of each one of these uh, adjustment screws to make sure they're not hot. 
because if they are, we'd have to get an insulated screwdriver to do this. All right, let's see. Yeah, I need to clean my, take this pointer off and clean it. But yeah, we're set to 455 kilocycles. And I know the IF is way out of alignment. How do I know that? Because whenever I turn the signal generator frequency down lower, you can see it gets much louder. Okay. All right, trimmer one on the second IF can. I think that one was pretty well spot on. Trimmer two. That one was off a little bit. Now we'll go to the first IF transformer and peek out its two tremors. That one was off. That one was way off. Now we want to turn our signal generator down. And go back through and peek out the four tremors again to for maximum output. Now we have our signal generator connected to the antenna input, and we have both the signal generator and radio 10 to 1600, which is the top end of the dial on the uh, radio. And then we want to peek out this oscillator tremor. That's the smallest section here on the capacitor for maximum output. Well, well, I just had another oops moment. I was adjusting this tremor instead of this tremor. This is the oscillator tremor right here. Okay, we peaked out our oscillator tremor, and then we tuned the dial back, back down to 1500 as well as the signal generator, and then peaked out the antenna tremor. It's WSM barely coming in, but at least it's coming in right there at 650. to make a wild guess. You're listening to an old tech radio show. Our guest today live is Jason Marshall. This is probably WLW 700. And of course, we know how to do only gas industry done a good enough job. Thing about these old radios, they don't have the digital display on them to tell you what uh, station you're tuned to at all times. It's 910 coming in about right. His name is Jesus Christ, 
I hope you're enjoying this great gospel music right here on WMER 93.1 FM and 1390 AM, your hometown good news gospel radio. The annual WMER Christmas Music Marathon. Stay tuned in to WMER and listen to all the Christmas songs sponsored to you from Boharala Autoplex. A guy who never was able to figure out the court. Home for Sunday Night Football. This is News Radio 1200 WOAI, San Antonio. All right, right on the button. Radio Traffic and weather, sports, business news, and so much more. CIAM weekdays beginning at 5 on KMOX. Welcome right, to the it's coming in about right. But I think you're right, he did Sarah. <laughs> what kind of dog? Oh, that sounds horrible. The mini radios, the better ones, you use the trimmer on the uh, condenser to set the high end of the dial, and then there's a slug in the oscillator coil to set the lower end of the dial, but many of these lower end radios, such as this one, don't have that. All you have is the tremor on the capacitor, and sometimes you can move the plates on the, uh, kind of carefully bend the plates on the oscillator section of the tuning condenser to get the tracking right towards the lower end of the dial, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to go to all that. That's kind of tedious. You just have to more or less get it set to where to where you get a good compromise between the high end and the low end, and that's just the way it is. You know, we're not talking about we're not talking about military grade uh, radio receiving equipment here. It has to be accurate with plus or minus point triple oh one percent tolerance here. Okay, we're back during the daytime. The chassis, as far as I'm concerned, is fixed. I've got the cabinet gluing back together, and when it dries, we'll put everything back together and be done with this. Now, reception-wise, it still picks up our little country station. There's the other country station, probably out of, I think that's the one out of Monroe. It's either the one out of Monroe, Louisiana, or the one on the, one out of Biloxi, I'm not sure which. And this talk station is 1620 out of Pensacola, Florida, so that's not bad. That's the talk station out of Jackson, Mississippi. There's something else very faint.
However, not bringing in 670. However, this little Zenith 8 transistor pocket radio from 1967 brings it in. Brings in 670 without any problem now. It's really not unusual because some of these tube sets are more sensitive at the high end of the dial than they are at the lower end. And I also have it uh, peaked out to get that little country station, so that could also have something to do with it. This camera is not helping the situation any either. Talk station out of Jackson. And so was I. We tried to hide. Do everything you can. All right, if I bring the radio up close to the antenna wire here and have the camera turned off. 1620 out of, what did I say, Jacksonville comes in pretty good. Okay, there's the country station. You might remember a while back, Shango 066 did a little comparison video out in the desert between some tube and some transistor radios, and the, as I recall, the older transistor sets generally won out. Not saying the tube radio is a bad radio, but I think this little Zenith is a bit more sensitive, but one thing's for certain, the... Uh, Zenith and the little cheap Emerson tube radio are both way more sensitive than the little Chineseium 666 boom boxes that have been made over the past 20 or so years. Okay, so as soon as the cabinet glue dries, we can put the chassis back in the cabinet and that'll be another one saved. Here's another station. It ate something that I've never been able to get a call sign for. Oh, I know it's some religious station, but all that squealing is the camera. Again, this radio is picking it up, but the Emerson will not. I actually have two Zenith radios with this chassis in it. One of them is from 66 and was made in the USA. This one is from 67 and was made in Hong Kong. So I guess 66, 67 must have been the transition year for the little pocket transistor radios to move from USA to overseas production. I think 1970, 71 was the last year for any American-made Zenith, and after that point they were all made overseas. A lot of them after them were actually made by Gold Star. Uh, several years ago, I had a little 72 Zenith AM FM clock radio that was made in Korea by Gold Star, and uh, it was an okay radio, but it was not nearly the quality that the older American made Zeniths were. And when I say quality, I mean in terms of actual build quality and performance. It just it just wasn't there. The older Zenith AM FM sets would bring in stations that nothing else would bring in, but a little Korean-made job from 72 was was doing good to bring in the local stations. Okay, just as an experiment, I have the signal generator tuned to 6-whatever, just radiate, radiating a signal into the air, and as you can hear, we hear a tone in the speaker very weakly. I'm going to adjust the antenna trimmer and see if we can peek out the low end of the dial. And 
we can. All right, it's a little after four in the afternoon, and I'll see what time is it. See exactly what time it is. Four thirteen. I think that's probably KMLX coming in. But yeah, this radio is more sensitive at the top end of the dock. Down below nine hundred, there's a portion where I get. Getting all this horrible electrical noise from somewhere. I need to go around with a transistor radio and try to see if that's originating from somewhere on my property or somewhere else. That's probably WWL out of New Orleans. Which that's not bad for it's not even dark yet. Correction, that's KMOX. Okay, this other station is 1180 out of Jackson, Mississippi. It's coming in about right. So like I've already said, this dial is never going to be completely accurate from top to bottom. That's just the way it is. Well, here's some talk station at six something out of Mobile. Yeah, all in all, this radio is not doing all that bad. Okay, WKRG. Okay, it's a quarter to five and 650 WSM is just Barely coming in, and I have it dialed right in. Okay, uh, and this camera is just determined not to focus. Casio Keep Exit out towards the east I 10. Looking at your standard afternoon congestion through the 6 10 merge past the high rise. Okay, that's 870 WWL, and it's coming in about right. Pointers between 850 and 900, so that's close enough. Like I said, this thing's never going to be fully accurate from top to bottom. There's some Steve Miller band coming in there. Running in a million other directions, but... The, Okay, I think we're about ready to put this back in the cabinet as soon as the glue dries. Okay, we have the Emerson back together and the cabinet fixed as good as I'm going to fix it. I glued it up as best I could and used a brown marker to fill in some of the dings. I did not worry about these speaker slats. I was afraid me messing with them may make it worse than what it already is, so we left it alone. WSM coming in and 
what time is it? Not even 10 minutes or so in the afternoon. That's pretty impressive. I think that's 670. Somebody got the idea. I want to know. <laughs> and guaranteed a project that finishes on time and on budget. Three Day Kitchen and Bath. Visit 3daykitchenandbath.com or call 824-4280. I was treasured. I was groomed. I was thoroughly loved. I was highly recruited. For, For my body. body. Human trafficking exists in Middle Tennessee and every day our children and young adults are manipulated, exploited, and trafficked. Probably WLAC. is on a mission to strategically confront the issue and promote the healing of human trafficking. Okay, that's it. But that's pretty impressive for not even 4 o'clock and bringing in all these distant stations. Even more so if there are children involved. If you're a father and want to protect your rights, consider Cordell and Cordell. As a partner men can count on, they have helped men with matters like these for 30 years. Visit CordellCordell.com to learn more. Contact Cordell and Cordell to schedule an appointment with one of our firm's Nashville area attorneys. A partner men can count on. Online at Cordell. Yeah, that's got to be 1510WLAC. State Franklin, Tennessee, 37067. Tech Talk Radio 98.3 at 1510 WLAC with you wherever you go. I'm Darn, I was right. I think people think I only watch sports. I don't know what station that is, but I wish... Wish that was. Wish we had something like that around here. You know, I'm not hard to please. I take something like that, or classic country, or oldies, or you know anything over the drivel that we have uh, on the local scene. Complaining against the state of Georgia. We are so close now. Keep your eyes upon the very house of life and death. 
All right, there you go. Another one wrapped up. <laughs> 